Thank you. And people can read in the book about, about it. I was practicing it when I shouldn't be going to sleep and I could tell that it would be very helpful, very, very <laughs> efficient. Um, so I'm going to read a question from Ramika, which is very specific to her, but I think um, that it will be something that a lot of people relate to parts of it and would love your advice on. So she says, I've recently been struggling by giving into my cravings. I've been able to resist before, but at the moment, uh, the voice in my head seems to have more weight than my self-control. I work with cardiologists every day and can see the impact. And I also have PCOS. I know I can be borderline diabetic. I've increased the variety of my food, something you advocate, um, and really step working up my working out, but struggle with cravings. And, and I'm sure many people want to know, how can I change my mindset? And what alternatives can you suggest to satisfy my sweet tooth and curb these cravings? Yeah, I love this. So there's many things you can do. So number one is, you know, we say it only takes three days to start changing your microbiome. And guess what? Those bacteria control our cravings. And so if you really try to eat very healthy, so you know how they say um, the saying that motivation actually follows action? Well, I truly believe that when it comes to changing your gut health, because you change your you make the action, action steps to change your diet. And then all of a sudden, your new gut bacteria start to crave the right things. And so your motivation starts to kick in. So not so maybe you white knuckled it and really tried hard for three days to eat healthy um, and low sugar and, um, you know, low on the treats. But after day three, you'll start to say, oh, wow, I'm craving the healthy foods. I'm craving the apple instead of the uh, junk food. I'm craving, um, you know, something healthy. So that's number one is changing your gut bacteria in as little as three days. And number two is really understanding that are you craving um, that sweet or are you craving that feeling of the dopamine? Because most of us are chasing dopamine. We want to feel good. And that's why we look at social media. That's why we gamble. That's why we drink alcohol. Maybe there are certain good things that you could do to help you release dopamine in a way that's healthy rather than unhealthy. Exercise, uh, sunlight, uh, more sleep. There are foods you can eat to raise your dopamine levels. There are um, other ways to release dopamine like massage or sauna, you know, so if, if there's dancing, laughing. There are so many different ways to release dopamine. Sometimes we're just stuck in the easiest way, um, which is, you know, eating a, a, a sweet. But there's other ways you can satisfy your dopamine cravings that don't have anything to do with unhealthy foods. Really useful. Thank you. Um, so Polly has a question about probiotics. We've sort of covered this, I, I think, but you might have other ways to say. She said, I've heard recently from probiotic supplement companies that natural probiotics, um, kombucha and sauerkraut, for example, are mostly destroyed by our stomach acid and don't reach or benefit our gut that well. Is this true? And how do we ensure our guts are getting the love they need, which is something we've talked about? But is that true? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, um, actually probiotic pills are more likely to get destroyed on the way to the gut. Because if you think about it, when you swallow a bunch of bacteria, it's our immune system's job to try to kill that bacteria because they don't want you to swallow a bunch of bacteria um, that have no purpose. Uh, they need to enter your body in a matrix. And so what all the supplement companies are trying to figure out is what is this matrix that they can kind of incorporate the bacteria in so that it will make it to the lower colon, which is where the, you know, the crux of all of this happens. Um, and there's no better way to get it than fermented food, actual sauerkraut, you know, kimchi, miso. Um, that's the matrix that we need. And um, like I said, the big, big conundrum that the drug companies have is like, how do we recreate this matrix so that our gut bacteria don't get killed on the way down? Um, and so that's, that's how I, it's always food first. It's really, really helpful to know that really interesting. I think many, many people will be really fascinated to know. Um, what's your opinion? And I'm glad um, 
um, this is asked on cyclical eating based on a hormonal cycle. Um, I love, I think women mm. um, often ignore their infradian rhythm, which is their 30, 28 day cycle that uh, most women of childbearing age have. So meaning that, um, you know, women, it's not like you're different people, but you're essentially um, have different needs at different times of the month. So right before your period, the week before your period, we call that in medical terms, the late luteal phase. During the late luteal phase, your body is less, um, is just more sensitive to stress and less resilient, meaning that this is the time that you want to give your body nourishing foods, you want to give them more sunlight, more sleep, more rest, and not do the hard training or the um, longer intermittent fast or the very stressful um, activities and eating in a way that nourishes your body. And then, um, you know, usually after day two or three of your period, your hormones rise again and you get that estrogen and testosterone and progesterone boost uh, to help you eat and train like an athlete. This is a time where you can push your body. Um, you can also digest and metabolize foods in a much better way. And so I think that when women learn how to manage um, their hormones through foods and activities, you can feel much more energized and in control. Really interesting. What, what, what about um, in terms of um, in, in terms of sort of uh, eating to stress, basically? So a lot of a lot of reasons um, for people to reach for their craving or to eat unhealthily is because they are incredibly stressed. And when you're stressed, you don't have time to think and you and you certainly want certain things. I wonder yes. what your advice is. Somebody was one asking about how to regulate your food cravings and how to minimize your stress, stressful cravings. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, stress is our biggest problem in the modern world. You know, we we know that certain activities like you know, being on the computer or um, not getting enough exercise or not getting enough sleep or having stressful um, emotional relationships are all things that will affect your hunger, your cravings, your mood um, overall. So the biggest thing I think of when it comes to stress is that realizing that sometimes when you reach for the food or the alcoholic drink or the snack, you're actually looking for stress relief. And again, there are other ways to relieve stress that are more productive for you than eating, you know, that piece of cake, for example. Uh, the way I think about it is like, eat the cake if you really want it, but don't eat the cake because you need to soothe yourself. Um, and if you need to soothe yourself, try to figure out one, why you need that soothing and two, what else can you be doing to help you soothe um, rather than um, eating that thing. Like one of the best tricks I have is to drink a hot liquid, like a tea or a coffee, something that is very soothing to our brain and body, but doesn't necessarily contain all the negative things that a processed food would. Um, really good question from someone which you talk about in the book about the order of which in which you could can eat. So would you advise to eat vegetables first, then protein, then carbs to regulate the sugar levels? Or um, is this not important? Very important. The order of foods is an extremely good way um, as a hack kind of to help you through when you're trying to figure out, OK, what are easy things I can do in my life Um to help me regulate my hunger, my cravings, and my inflammation levels. This is one of the best tricks, meaning that when you go to a restaurant, you get the bread first, you know, and what you do is you eat the bread and your body is expecting a lot of food. And so it starts to release all of these um, secondary hormones to anticipate food, making you hungrier, making you want to eat more um, in that moment. Um, and it raises your blood sugar because it's very low in fiber. Um, if you just switch this around and have a soup, a salad, the protein, and then have your bread or dessert at the end, 
so that the carbohydrates comes at the end, you're much more likely to not only regulate your blood sugar, but regulate your cravings throughout the day. What about intermittent fasting? You talk about that in the book. You talk about your own um, decision to eat um, between only certain hours. Do you advocate that for everyone? I think everyone should be doing some form of um, time-restricted eating, which is the more proper form. Time-restricted eating just means that um, you're eating all of your food within the window of time um, specified. So I usually like to use um, a typical window of time where you stop eating two to three hours before bed. Because generally, if you think about it, thousands of years ago, um, you know, we didn't have refrigerators and microwaves and takeaway and all those options to eat big meals late at night. Mostly you ate dinner. Even if you think about your grandparents, for most of us, you know, you ate dinner and maybe you had a small snack, but you weren't really eating a lot, um, you know, after dinner. And so, and interestingly, our body works best that way. When melatonin is secreted, two to three hours before bed, it's actually telling our organs to turn down their ability to metabolize because it wants to say, right now you're not gonna get a lot of food. So concentrate on repair and renewal and less on metabolism. So what happens is if you then go and eat a huge meal and give your body a big load of food to digest and to metabolize, it's going to be impaired in its um, way. And that's why you see a lot of people having weight gain, but also GI issues like heartburn and indigestion when they eat late at night. It's interesting that, um, what about if you get very hungry later in the day, for example, you're not hungry during these hours when you should be hungry, for example, and you find that your hunger really peaks at around in the evening time. Is it better to eat when you're very hungry or to just stick to what you're told and, and not eat sort of later yeah. in the day? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you can change your hunger hormone patterns by 30 minutes a day. So for example, um, we are cyclical in our hunger patterns. This is very evident when you travel somewhere, right? With a different time zone, you're hungry at the weirdest time because your hunger um, hormones work on a cyclical pattern also, and it matches your home time zone. And so you are able to switch that. As you know, when you go to a new place after a few days, your hunger patterns kind of normalize and you start getting hungry at the times of the new destination. So same way, you can retrain your body to be hungry at the right times of day. So if you start to say, um, you know, to your body, like, I'm not really going to eat too much in the evenings. After a few days, your body gets used to it and your hunger levels really come down. And so um, you can train it to say, okay, I'm going to move up my dinner by 30 minutes every day until I've got, got it to the place where I want it to be. So is eating sort of, you know, creeping down to the kitchen in the evenings, late at night, is that a, a big fat cross over that? We shouldn't be doing that. It, it's a, it's, it's not something where, you know, you want to say, I can't eat anything and I can't put anything in my mouth, but think about it physiologically, your body is in its sleep mode and you want to be doing your biggest meals, your most number of calories during the daylight hours. If I equate it to, I tell people this um, kind of analogy, you know, if someone woke you up in the middle of the night and asked you to do a complicated math problem, you would not only struggle yeah. But you would be really tired in the morning um, and angry because you had to wake up and do this um, complicated. That's the same thing as our metabolism. Like the, our metabolism is not meant to ingest large amounts of food and metabolize and store it. And when you ask your body to do that, you're going to have consequences. Yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, a, a question that's really interesting to me, because you've talked about how many benefits eating a lot of protein has, really so many benefits, and we've, we've been through a lot of them. 
Um, somebody asks then, what do you think of the keto diet, which is, of course, heavily weighted towards protein, isn't it? Um, which is very fashionable now. I mean, I know you don't approve of diets, so I wonder what your answer to that question. I, I think the same way I answered with the question about plant-based diets is the same way I would answer the question about keto. I think it can be done very healthfully with lots of fiber, vegetables, and um, you know, probiotic foods or it can be done in an extremely unhealthy way. For example, I know people who eat cheese with bacon in the morning, you know, and it's considered keto, That's, but that's not healthy. Um, and then they'll have, you know, a fast food burger without the bun and, you know, with cheese, that's not healthy, but that's keto. So it can be very difficult because we are given all this messaging about this diet and that diet, but in every one of those diets, we're missing the boat on, um, you know, the foods that our gut bacteria really need to regulate our hunger hormones so that we can stay on something that's sustainable, um, not only from the diet standpoint so that we can be healthy, but also so that we can be happy and more even in our mood. I think it's really interesting what you say there. I think a lot of diets give people this excuse to just go wholeheartedly in one direction so for example with plant-based then people drink a lot of plant-based milks which are full of you know awful things and you, you yeah be a lot better off drinking um drinking sort of organic whole milk dairy milk so I think it's just about not being slave slavish to one thing and therefore forgetting what's important absolutely Diet culture has really tricked us into thinking that there's one answer mm. um, and that's why there's so many fights. But really the answer is if you feed your gut bacteria, they will be happy and they will produce chemicals to make you um, happier and choose healthier foods. And so then it becomes less of a diet. It becomes more of a um, strategy to say, hey, let's just do things that are going to help that gut brain connection, because that in turn will help us uh, crave the right foods, will help us feel happy, will help us differentiate between um, hunger and cravings. Um, so that's why I concentrate on that. So there's so much more to ask you. T tell us before we let you go reluctantly, where can people find much more apart from in the book? I think on your website. Yes, you can go to amymdwellness.com, A-M-Y-M-D wellness.com. Um, and if you do amymdwellness.com forward slash book, um, you can get an, a free chapter and some bonuses uh, that I only offer on there. Okay. And there are so many brilliant, wonderful, delicious recipes at the end of the book as well, and um, kind of meal plans and so much more in there that we, of course, don't have the time to discuss in an hour. But I think people can get the sense that it is incredibly useful information and empowering, really, because a lot of the time we feel so despairing. There's so much out there. It's so hard to figure out what's what. And it's really fascinating hearing from you with with your knowledge and, and enthusiasm, as I said at the start. So thank you very much to everyone for signing in. Lots of you, brilliant questions as ever. Um, and uh, Amy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me. having me.